We're going to discuss carbocation rearrangements, which are covered in the alkenes and alkynes, electrophilic addition, and pericyclic reactions chapter. We're first going to start off by defining what a carbocation rearrangement is. And it's the reaction of a carbocation to form a more stable carbocation, typically by the movement of a hydrogen atom or an alkyl group from a carbon adjacent to the carbocation. And these are so-called one-two shifts. So we'll look at an example of each of these. Here's an example of a one-two hydride shift where we start with a secondary carbocation. The hydrogen shifts to the neighboring carbon, exchanges positions with the positive charge, which moves to this position here. And here is the product from this 1,2 hydride shift. We go from a secondary carbocation to a more stable tertiary carbocation. Similarly, we can propose a 1,2 alkyl shift where we now move the methyl group on the adjacent carbon, it exchanges positions, the positive charge, the electron density in this carbon-methyl bond here moves to the neighboring carbon, we form a new carbon-carbon bond, and we form a new tertiary carbocation. The starting carbocation is secondary, the product is tertiary, so we form a more stable carbocation from this rearrangement. So we're going to look at some examples now of carbocation rearrangements and start by rearrangements that have been proposed to take place in nature, and in particular in the synthesis of terpenes. And this family of compounds are formed by enzyme-initiated carbocation rearrangement processes. And we'll start off by looking at a classic example of a terpene synthesis from geronyl pyrophosphate. So nature uses geronyl pyrophosphate, which contains a leaving group here. This is nature's leaving group. And it converts geronyl pyrophosphate into a number of different organic compounds called terpenes, one of which is limonene here. And in the presence of the enzyme R-limonene synthase, geronyl pyrophosphate is converted into R-limonene, and we form the ring system as shown. Now, the mechanism for this reaction has been postulated to involve carbocation intermediates. So let's have a look at this process. The first thing that's believed to happen is we break the carbon-oxygen bond and we kick out the leaving group to form this allylic cation. And this allylic cation is resonance-stabilized. I can draw two other resonance forms of this carbocation. In this case, the carbon atom is pointing up and I can push electron density towards the positive charge to give me this resonance form. I can then push the electron density back to form a resonance form with the carbocation carbon is pointing down now. So these are the three resonance forms. When the carbon of the carbocation is pointing down, you can see we can get a cyclization reaction with this CC double bond connect as a nucleophile to attack the positive charge. In the presence of an enzyme, you can get a stereoselective formation of this chiral center, and then finally this tertiary carbocation that's derived from this cyclization loses a proton, and we form the CC double bond in R limonene. Let's now look at another example of a terpene synthesis. And it's proposed that in nature, germacreme A, which is a naturally occurring compound, is converted into epiaristolacine via a series of carbocation rearrangements. So let's have a look at a possible mechanism for this transformation. And it's in the first step, it's postulated that in the presence of an enzyme, we get regioselective protonation of this carbon-carbon double bond to form this tertiary carbocation. And it's then postulated that this tertiary carbocation is converted to three other tertiary carbocations en route to epiaristolacine. So let's have a look at the first reaction sequence. The first process involves cyclization from the carbon-carbon double bond to form this ring system, this bicyclic ring system. We form a new tertiary carbocation. The electron density moves from the double bond to form this carbon-carbon bond. We land up with a positive charge here. Now what happens is a 1-2 hydride shift. 
the hydrogen on the neighboring carbon moves, moves to the electron deficient carbon, taking its electron density with it. We form a new carbon hydrogen bond and it exchanges positions with a positive charge. So the positive charge moves from here to the neighboring carbon and I get another new tertiary carbocation. It's interesting to look at the stereochemistry. You'll see that in this starting carbocation, the CH bond is on the bottom of the molecule and in the product, it's also on the bottom of the molecule. So the H moves on the bottom face to form this new CH bond. We then get a similar process taking place with this adjacent methyl group now on the carbon atom adjacent to the carbon bearing the positive charge. We take the electron density from this carbon-carbon bond, we donate it towards the positive charge, we form a new carbon-carbon bond here, and the positive charge moves to this position, so we, yet, we form yet another tertiary carbocation. Again, it's interesting to look at stereochemistry, and we see, because the methyl group is on the bottom of the molecule in the starting material, it lands up on the bottom of the molecule in the product. The final thing that happens is we lose a proton, to form the carbon-carbon double bond in epi-aristolacy. Let's now have a look at a carbocation rearrangement that takes place in the laboratory. And this is a very interesting transformation of this molecule here, which contains an epoxide, and it's converted into this ketone using this two-step process. What's very interesting for us is that these hydrogen and methyl groups change position in the product. And very interestingly as well, they also change stereochemistry. So in the starting material, they're both pointing away from us, but in the product, they're both pointing towards us. And the mechanism from going from the starting material to the product has been postulated to involve a series of carbocations. So let's have a look at this particular mechanism. The mechanism starts by taking a lone pair on the oxygen and the epoxide and donating it towards the Lewis acid, and this forms a coordination complex. The epoxide ring then opens selectively within the coordination complex to form this carbocation here, and this triggers then a series of carbocation rearrangements. The first thing that happens is we get a shift of the methyl group on the neighboring carbon atom, a classic 1,2 alkyl shift. It moves from the bottom of the molecule to this position here again, we get a new carbon-carbon bond on the bottom face, and we go from a secondary carbocation to a tertiary carbocation. Next, we get a 1-2 hydride shift. The hydrogen atom on the neighboring carbon moves across, and we form another tertiary carbocation. Notice stereochemistry. The hydrogen is on the top of the molecule here. It's on the top of the molecule here. We then lose a proton to form a carbon-carbon double bond. And then in the second step, we take this molecule here, which contains the carbon-carbon double bond, and react it with acid and water. We break the oxygen-boron bond under these conditions, and we replace the boron with a hydrogen. And when we have an OH on a carbon-carbon double bond, we call that an enol. And enols are in tautomerism, the so-called keto forms. And the equilibrium lies heavily towards the keto in this system, and so we get this ketone here. And this is the final product from the reaction. So it's very interesting to see in this mechanism that the exchange of the hydrogen and methyl groups and their stereochemistry can be explained by this series of carbocation rearrangement processes.